the Northwest Law and Mental Health Conference brings together expert speakers with legal, clinical, and lived experience to discuss the impact of the law on people with mental illness and addiction. Our spring 2020 conference was postponed due to COVID-19, so presenters recorded their sessions, which are now embedded in the conference website, along with their collateral information. Thanks to all our expert presenters, generous sponsors, exhibitors, volunteers, and the planning committee for the Northwest Law and Mental Health Conference. Stay well, and we hope to see you in 2021. So thanks for joining us. Um, for the next hour or so, I'd like to talk about disability rights strategy in Oregon in the next year. And part of that strategy is gonna to be to start by looking at the numbers of people who identify as having disabilities in our state, the benefit of collaboration and the history of collaboration within the disability rights movement. And then finally, ending with advocacy strategies um, and some ideas of how we can all work together to improve the lives of Oregonians with disabilities in the year ahead. Our, um, there are three topics I'll be covering. First, I'm gonna start with numbers and why numbers matter. And I know for the lawyers listening, you may be glazing over because we're talking math attention. Yeah, we're talking about numbers and why they matter. Um, the second topic is going to be collaboration. Um, how it served us, uh, the disability rights community in the past, and how it will serve us moving forward. And included in that conversation will be all of the different organizations in Oregon that serve people with disabilities. And then finally, we'll wrap up with some advocacy strategies. I'll be sharing some things that Disability Rights Oregon is going to be doing in the year ahead, but please know that part of our work is always rooted in what our constituents and community think we need to focus on. And so as I'll discuss later um, about my organization is, Every year we work for input from the community. So as you're listening to this information, be thinking about if there are things that should be on our radar that I don't talk about today. So the first section is why numbers matter. And so for any of you who have maybe watched uh, Crip Camp on Netflix, um, these folks may look, even though they're in profile, may look familiar to you. These are advocates at University of California, Berkeley in the late 1960s, led by Ed Roberts, who a lot of folks call the father of the independent living movement. Um, Ed Roberts was a person with a physical disability who was at UC Berkeley and realized that a lot of the classes he couldn't even attend because he was in a wheelchair. And so together with a couple of other, really other fierce advocates, he was um, raising the awareness to the college administrators of why it mattered. But the look here, there's you know, four, maybe five people that were locking their wheelchairs to these doors to get attention. And so while it was a, a fierce movement, um, it was a small and mighty movement. And then next, um, some of you all may, may know about ADAPT. It's, um, I often refer to it as sort of the equivalent of the Black Panthers uh, compared to uh, Dr. Martin Luther King in the Civil Rights era. ADAPT is a group of advocates that often um, take very interesting approaches to advocacy, including here in Denver, um, again in the late 60s, really frustrated that they were paying public tax dollars for public buses but couldn't physically get on those buses because they weren't accessible. And so what they did is they got out of their wheelchairs and were either rolled or crawled into the middle of the street laying on blankets so that the bus physically couldn't move. And again, similar to Ed Roberts, who again, um, small but mighty numbers, but they really made a difference because the city of Denver had to quickly figure out how they were going to accessibly um, provide transport to people with physical disabilities. Now I'm gonna jump ahead a couple of decades to what uh, many of us know as the Capitol Crawl. This was also um, a demonstration by ADAPT. And you'll see here in the picture, um, a lot of members of the media covered this issue where disability rights advocates were so frustrated that the Americans with Disabilities Act had finally passed, but it was almost years, I was going on two years before they had promulgated the regulation. And so people with disabilities, including this child, were dumped out at the bottom of the US Capitol steps and crawled up. And one of the things that made this so powerful, again, back to numbers, 
is for the first time, the members of the mainstream media and the public realize how many people with disabilities are out there and how even our federal government was not accessible to them. Now I'm gonna jump ahead to five years ago. And this is in Cincinnati, Ohio, not the biggest city in the world, but this is the number of people who came out for the 25th, 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I mean, as the disability rights movement, we have realized the powers of numbers, the power of collective action, starting with Ed Roberts um, and moving forward today. And so I thought this was a little bit of interesting history because it helps explain why collaboration is important because we can expand those numbers and how that feeds into our strategy uh, and how to make those effective. So, as a legal director at Disability Rights Oregon, part of what I think about is who are we talking about? And this is according to the US Census, um, nearly one in four Oregonians experience a disability. That may seem like a lot, more than maybe uh, non-disabled folks are aware of, but um, this also pans out with the national average. And so Oregon, um, quarter of us identify as having a disability, as does uh, the entire population of the United States. And so we're really on trend that one in four of every Oregon has a disability. And this is where, I don't wanna get sidetracked too much, but part of what's been really important about the disability rights movement is how do you define disability? Um, as Jason mentioned at the top of this presentation, a lot of the activism started with people with physical disabilities because you could see them and you could treat them differently because you could see them. Um, but a lot of people with disabilities, including myself, have hidden disabilities. So you can't see or tell. And so that's where bias um, or internalized oppression can play a role. And so a big part of activism is letting people be out and proud. Um, so whether or not you have mental illness or cognitive disabilities or epilepsy or anything else that again, you can't necessarily see. Um, doesn't mean that you aren't impacted um, by a disability. And so here's a breakout of disability based on Oregonian counties. And what I think is really interesting about this is you'll see in the graph on the right um, gradations. So over 30%, 25%, 20%, 15%. And it's color coded where the darker counties have the highest percentage of disabilities. And What's interesting about this is if you then break it out into a graph, is Coos, Malheur, and Morrow counties have the greatest percentage of Oregonians with disabilities. But when you go back to that map, think about what disability services are likely in that area. I can tell you where Disability Rights Oregon is, and that's in Multnomah County, which is only 21.7% um, of having people with disabilities. Um, a lot of programs are also in Marion County or Lane County, but again, those counties have 24% um, percent people with disabilities. And so part of what we have to think about in our strategy ahead is making sure we're also thinking about geographic diversity and that our strategy and our efforts is truly, we're disability rights Oregon. We serve the whole state, we're not disability rights Portland or disability rights Salem. And so we really have to think about every person in the state and making sure that we reach out to them, we consider their needs um, and develop related advocacy strategies. So this is where we're gonna pause um, and see if Jason has any questions for me about this data or these numbers. I think you're on mute. You're exactly right. Hi, Emily. Um, so how do you determine the numbers uh, per county? How are numbers determined? So the University Center on Education Excellence for Developmental Disabilities, or UCID, is um, one of our national partners. And just like there's in every state, there's a disability rates fill in the blank, there's also a UCID. And so the UCID of Oregon is who actually pulled that information together. They have uh, statisticians, and, um, and I don't know exactly how they pulled it together, but they the reason why they're a partner of ours is they know how to look at data and they know how to um, gather information so that we can, again, think about impacting the entire state. 
Do, do you have any thought on why the data is so variant? That's a big difference of numbers. You know, I don't. I mean, my guess is just like anyone else, um, you're going to have different diversity based on um, age and access to services. And so the part that I wonder about, and I sometimes say half jokingly, is if you don't have a disability now, maybe if you have the privilege of getting old enough, you may, you may have one. Um, we know that with aging can come some physical limitations or cognitive limitations. So it's very possible that part of this is also including the aging population. Um, I do know that um, people with disabilities also tend to not necessarily congregate in metropolitan areas because of accessibility issues um, and traffic. And so it makes sense why there is both rural and urban um, representation of people with disabilities. So for in, I understand that services for people with mental illness and addiction are more likely to be in metropolitan areas. What is the service provision like in rural and suburban areas in Oregon? We know that it's poor. Um, and we know that from looking at you know, how um, the math epidemic impacted our state is that co-occurring or people with both mental illness and substance use need um, weren't simply getting services in those areas. Um, I think we could say the same is true for larger, more urban populations, but at, a, at the bottom line, what we look at is making sure there's equitable access to services, and we know for certain that rural or regionians with disabilities have real challenges in not only accessing services because they don't exist, but transportation is also a really key um, hurdle. Is this a, an Oregon problem or is this a national problem? I think it's national, but I think states um, like Washington, where there tends to be divides around an, the I-5 corridor, um, you can see some of these disparities um, grow. Um, you know, the I-5 corridor tends to be where the most, uh, most of the population of Oregon exists. And so when you think about um, representation and you think about, um, you know, who's closest to the capital, I think you do end up seeing some disparities from folks versus folks who live um, in areas outside of the corridor or on the eastern part of the state. And, it's one of the reasons why um, one of our, um, well, I'll be talking about a little bit later, one of our strategies is making sure that we look at um, class action or other systemic relief that really factor in um, other aspects of our state. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So moving into the next section, um, collaboration, or what my grandfather would call the bundle of sticks now. So I'll explain that a little bit, so I'm not just full on hokey. Um, my grandfather taught me when I was really little that you could pick up one stick and break it pretty easily. But if you had a bundle of sticks, it's harder to break and it's stronger. And so that's something I've long known. And what was really cool, and I actually got chilled the first time that I read it, um, is Ed Roberts, the person I talked about being the father of this, the independent living, sorry, independent living movement, um, talked about collaboration as together, if we look towards the future, we want to exist. And that we look at it together, and it's not just the four people who lock themselves to the, the doors at UC Berkeley, but it's all of us. And so um, I think it helps motivate to know that we're not alone in our individual advocacy efforts, um, or we shouldn't be. And so that's where I want to start talking about who exists in Oregon to provide disability advocacy. Um, and I added some fancy little sounds for the animation. Um, and the biggest part, I, I put in the Centers for Independent Living, and the reason I did that is not because they're more important than any of these other advocacy organizations, but because I wanted each of you to be able to see looking at this. ILR, um, Independent Living Resources, that's the Center for Independent Living in Walk that serves Washington, Multnomah, and Clackamas counties. Able Tree or Abila Tree serves the middle of the state. EOCIL serves Eastern. Lila serves the Eugene area, and et cetera. And so there's these. This is Ed Roberts's work, 
he wanted there to be localized centers for independent living for people with disabilities, regardless of whether it was a physical disability or not. And the benefit of that is back to Jason and you and I have commented earlier about how you can look at disparities depending on where someone exists in the state. The benefit of having local advocacy organizations is they are the most familiar with um, what's going on for people with disabilities in that area. In addition to the Centers for Independent Living, we have OSAC, Oregon Self Advocates Coalition, the ARC, um, the Disability Art and Culture Project, the Oregon DD Coalition, NAMI Oregon, ICO, which is African Youth and Community Organization, Paralyzed Veterans of America, Aging and Disability Resource Connection Oregon. And I will just tell you, these are the organizations I could just list offhand that I've worked with in the two years that I've been legal director at Disability Rights Oregon. There are a host of others, including those um, specifically related to people's disabilities, for example, the MS Society, the Autism Society, et cetera. Um, but these are the folks that I work with most closely. Um, to explain a little bit about what each one does, OSAC, um, is self-advocate. So these are people with lived experience, including people on the autism spectrum. And um, where the disability rights movement um, is moving is nothing about us without us. And so instead of having able-bodied or people who don't identify as having a disability lead us, um, it's the people who are experiencing a disability that are doing the leading. Um, the Arc of Oregon primarily serves people with intellectual disabilities. The Disability Art and Culture Project, I put this out there because they're a super cool group that talks about making sure people with disabilities are visible in the arts. The DD Coalition is similar to OSAC in that it's a mixture of people who identify as having a disability in that. Uh, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, Oregon, um, primarily is um, advancing the rights of people with mental illness. PBA, um, they do a lot of work with veterans. And then um, the other two organizations work, um, I co-work with African youth in particular, and then ADRC primarily works with seniors. And so these are just a couple of organizations that you all know about. Um, so if, as you're developing your own advocacy strategies, um, it's really important if you're going to advance an idea or push or ask for something that you reach out to the organizations who are on the front lines every day. Um, so now this is where I tell you a little bit about more like my organization, Disability Rights Oregon. So Disability Rights Oregon, we've been around for over 40 years. We're the designated protection and advocacy agency for Oregon. It sounds like a mouthful because it is. It's actually how we're codified in federal law um, to provide these services to people with disabilities throughout the state of Oregon. And so our five federal mandates, and for the lawyer nerds out there, I did a little asterisk and our actual um, implementing regulations in the bottom right of the screen. Um, we are obligated, we get federal funds and we've gotten federal funds for nearly 40 years to provide outreach, monitoring, advocacy, information referral and investigation regarding the rights of people with disabilities in Oregon. And so um, when you look at those implementing regulations, it's system requirements. These are things that we're obligated to do. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how those fit into our multimodal advocacy next. Um, but before I do, um, as I mentioned at the top of this presentation, every year we establish the priorities of what our agency can work on. We get finite dollars, we have finite staff, and we serve, again, a quarter of all Oregonians. And so we, unfortunately, um, one of our toughest things we have to do is pick and choose what we do every year with those resources. Um, but um, this is actually hyperlinked. So Jason, when you share this presentation, folks can just hover over this priorities and go to our current priorities or what we do. Um, and also go to our annual priority um, setting process. So just always know we're looking to the members of the community um, to help us, uh, again, use our funds. Right now, our priorities are community living and accessibility. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, but it's essentially making good on Ed Roberts' promise that people with disabilities are in the most integrated setting. We also do a lot of work with employment. 
and that includes the Client Assistance Program, or CAP. We also um, work with uh, protection and advocacy around people with uh, Social Security benefits, that's where CABs work. And then we have um, work, incentive, work Incentive Planning Advisors, or WIPA. Those are folks that help people that are on Social Security and are trying to get back to work and having that mitigate um, Social Security benefits. We do healthcare advocacy, we do self-determination, um, education, and then core rates and institutions. Those are all, all of those external um, on this PowerPoint, all of these are things that um, we get to pick and choose from what we do every year. But the middle, um, the hub of our work is freedom from abuse and neglect. This is our number one priority. And this one is especially critical given the COVID-19 pandemic. I will tell you about 80% of my uh, work day right now is responding to um, allegations of abuse and neglect um, from people with disabilities regarding the, the pandemic. And so that's what the federal government asks us to do. And so that's what we do. Um, so then the next thing I want to talk about is that is basically why I love working at Disability Rights Oregon. We are completely unique in our access authority and how we can get people with disabilities and their records to mitigate harm. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit um, by giving you a little bit of history so I just can help myself. Um, many of you may know Geraldo Rivera as the, the mustache um, talking head on CNN or whatever news channel you watch. Um, he actually gained um, national prominence in the late 60s with his expose of Willowbrook, which was a state school for people with intellectual disabilities in upstate New York. And Geraldo got um, a confidential source telling him about atrocities that were happening at the school. So he brought in a hidden camera and a video and he um, exposed these atrocities. And what I find interesting is only two years earlier, um, Attorney General Kennedy at the time had also gone to Willowbrook School and called it a statehood. So you have the highest attorney in our country arguably one of the most powerful people in terms of law enforcement, say that this place was a snake pit, but nothing happened. Two years later, Geraldo goes in with his camera and you have Congress act quickly and they passed essentially a series of protection and advocacy acts that set up organizations like Disability Rights Oregon, Washington, California, et cetera. So there is a watchdog group um, in every state like ours because of Geraldo, so kind of a funny story, but the, the, when you look at the legislative intent behind um, our access authority to people with disabilities and their records, and again, lawyer note, uh, nerds, there's the Code of Federal Regulation citation at the bottom of the screen. Congress, after seeing what happened at Willowbrook, said we want a group in every single state that can provide information and referral to people with disabilities because rights are only as important as people, one, know about them and two, enforce them. Um, we want them to monitor conditions of facilities and we also want them to inspect. So we can go into any facility in Oregon and take photos and videos of any areas that are accessible by residents. That is, that is a lot of power. Um, and again, when you think about our history, it makes sense because atrocities can happen when there's a six foot cinder block wall between you and the outside world. So this is my little shout out to Geraldo Rivera. Um, and so with this authority, I mentioned that DRO does multimodal advocacy. Really what that means, it's a fancy word for, you know, three-legged stool, lots of different tools in the toolbox. It, we look at any and every possibility to affect system change in our state, starting with individual advocacy. We don't know what to ask for or where to go until we talk with the person with a disability and we understand what their needs and wants are. Again, nothing about us without us. And once we hear about one person, we can then do systemic advocacy, um, changing systems, educate people why that's important, telling their stories, and then pushing. Uh, their stories on social media. And so I will give you just one example from last week. 
we got uh, information that an individual with developmental disability had been coerced into a do not resuscitate at a rural hospital in Oregon because of her intellectual disability and being COVID-19 positive. Well, we weren't able to get to her. Um, we were initially denied, but again, thanks Geraldo. We were able to get to her and her records, find out that it was coercive, and get her permission to reach out to the Oregon Developmental Disability Services Division of our state and say, we need to figure out something systemic because it's not just going to be her. There are going to be others with intellectual disabilities that are going to be impacted. Um, we then educate and we're planning on educating the legislature why they need to make protections and, and telling her story. Um, you know, I'm not sharing her name or anything identifying today because I she hasn't made that choice yet, but I am telling the story of what happened so that people understand that I'm not, we're not just chicken little talking about um, a disparate impact on people with disabilities during this pandemic. Um, so that's our multimodal advocacy. Um, and we talk a lot about education, information referral, outreach and storytelling, but I wanted to give a, just a few concrete examples to just bring it home. First, you know, the trainings, we do a lot like this one because we want people to know we exist. We want people to know our powers and we want people to let us know how we should use those powers. So training is really important and, and getting outreach in, into different communities. Um, we also, I just started up a COVID-19 task force. Wish me luck as I navigate the technology to make that happen. Um, Last year, we started doing a lot of e-scooter advocacy because we've heard from so many people worried about um, these machines zipping up and down our sidewalks um, without thinking about people uh, with disabilities or the elderly or children. We also provide technical assistance and information referral. Last year, um, we provided um, over 300 individual advocacy um, technical assistance calls, but Every year it's between 200 and 50 and 300. So that's a lot of people with disabilities learning about their rates. Uh, we also do publications uh, to educate people about their rates. Um, some of you may remember Sarah Radcliffe in my office wrote a report in 2017 called Don't Look Around, where using our access authority, she went into Norcor to explain how that facility was treating children with disabilities. Um, and uh, the result of that, as many of you all know, tracked her and her work was to um, essentially shut down that facility and improve how um, juvenile detention centers treat kids with disabilities. The other thing we do, and it's really important this year, but every year, um, is ensuring equal access to voting. Um, but we're not in Wisconsin. Um, so, Next, I wanna take a pause and talk about some of our individual advocacy services that we're working on right now. First, uh, we handle special education issues. Um, and that could be a child who is being denied um, a individualized education plan. It could also be a child who's being expelled because based on disability related behaviors. And so we handle between 10 and 20 individual special education advocacy cases every year. Um, the other thing we do a lot on is abuse and neglect. Again, I mentioned the um, coercive DNR, but um, our abuse and neglect individual advocacy is our highest priority and we handle dozens of cases a year on that. Um, the other individual advocacy case, I think, again, helps explain why Individual, advoc individual advocacy feeds into systemic is we worked with a, a woman um, who's a parent with girls um, who had a lived in um, a rural area uh, that was not accessible, had a wheelchair. And so we started to realize um, some of the accessibility that we were seeing in bigger cities wasn't happening to smaller towns. And so we worked with the local um, officials to help create a better accessible plan. Um, and then that fed into our Oregon Department of Transportation work, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then finally, um, we are concerned about um, racial disparities in healthcare and the intersectionality between race and disability. We know uh, that the health disparities, when you are not only a person of color, but 
um, you are also a person with a disability are, are really um, at critical stages. And so we provide advocacy to make sure people get quality care. Um, uh, there are five examples that um, this slide just highlights, but I'm going to go into detail about, um, which is our systemic advocacy. A lot of it relates to class action litigation, because uh, that's a, an easy tool um, to get a relief for a lot of people, um, easy being relative. Um, and then the other big systemic advocacy tool is legislation. And so first I'm going to start with some of our um, class action work. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, we reached a settlement agreement um, with ODDS regarding the rates of children with disabilities to get in-home care service hours. Um, and that includes adults. So people with intellectual disabilities run the ages of people with who are typically developing. And so but the difference is a lot of people, adults and children with disabilities need services in their homes and communities so that they can stay um, Oregon is one of the leaders in our state to close what um, was originally called ICFMRs, Immediate Care Facilities for the Mentally Retarded. Um, notably, Willowbrook State School um, was also an ICFMR, and Oregon was great in that we decided, hey, we don't want institutionalized people with intellectual disabilities anymore. Fantastic. We want them to live in their homes and communities, but in order to do that successfully, they have to get the services they need. And a few years ago, ODDS um, was going to change their assessment and how they allotted hours to people with intellectual disabilities, thereby putting them at risk of going into an institution. So we threw up a red flag. We said, please don't do this. Um, you know, we may need to litigate. And ultimately, we agreed. And so we're still monitoring that so that folks don't get their in-home services cut. Uh, the other thing that I think you've probably heard us talk about at this conference is the Oregon Advocacy Center v. Mink case. That was a case that was decided and the order came down from a federal court here in our state in 2002. So it's 18 years old and it's about people who are charged with crimes but have um, a mental illness or traumatic brain injury or an otherwise disability that makes it impossible for them to aid and assist in their own defense. So even though that is an 18-year-old order, um, we are still for fighting to enforce it. Um, just two weeks ago, the Oregon Health Authority notified the public that they are no longer admitting patients um, under aid and assist unless they need a really heightened um, expedited triage level. And so we are really worried that as of Monday, there are 34 people with mental illness languishing in jail because they can't go to the state hospital, even though the court ordered them to the state hospital. So uh, in two days, we're going to go back to the federal court and argue to the judge why we think that still violates the Constitution and that even in a pandemic, especially in a pandemic, we need to be mindful of the constitutional bedrock of our society. So um, that is one of my biggest priorities right now is youth enforcement. Uh, the other big class action we filed last year is JN versus ODN, ODE. And many folks may be like, oh, acronym land, true. But JN is the name of a plaintiff that we use their initials, so they're not identified. Um, but it is a young person who was denied education because of their disability and related behaviors. And so what we are seeing, again, going back to um, ensuring we are also equitable in terms of serving all Oregonians with disabilities, we noticed that children with disabilities getting educational services in rural districts were more likely to be um, removed from school or only offered a partial day of school. And in some ways that makes sense because maybe these rural districts simply don't have the resources. But the problem is children with disabilities shouldn't have different access to services depending on the resources of a school district when there's a federal mandate to provide special education services. So we filed that last year. We're in the middle of discovery. The relief we want is that every child with disabilities 
uh, gets free and appropriate public education regardless of their disabilities and behavioral health support. Um, the other case um, I perhaps um, stupidly filed a month after JN is um, Wyatt B. Brown. And I say stupidly because it's a lot to file two class actions in two months. But thinking back to the abuse and neglect impacting our clients, I felt like we didn't have a choice. We are hearing that, and you can see on the chart on the right of the screen, that more and more children in um, child welfare were being sent out of state um, and in institutions that don't have the same protections and rules that apply to children in our state. In particular, uh, on the left, this is an actual photo of a child drawing at the Red Rock Canyon School in Utah where Oregon um, children from Oregon were sent. Um, and you can see um, violence, abuse, trauma. We were, we were really worried. And so we felt like we had no choice but to file this case. And we're also embroiled um, in litigation and in the middle of discovery. And what we want there is that children with disabilities, um, children who are aging out, children who are sexual or gender minorities, and all of foster care children get the home and community support they need to stay um, in their schools, near their families, whether that's foster families or not, and that they aren't shipped out of state or exposed unnecessarily to trauma. And then um, the last case many of you all may know about, um, again, if you get this slide back, this is actually a wonderful little video of Paula Lane, our lead plaintiff in the Lane v. Brown case that we filed seven years ago, before my time. Um, but we reached a settlement agreement, um, essentially closing Shelford workshop. Sheltered workshops are a message, essentially of FDR, like truly FDR established a way for people with intellectual disabilities to have a place to go to during the day um, to get some vocational training. Well, a lot has changed since FDR's time, and we really want people with disabilities, intellectual disabilities, to have what we're calling competitive integrated employment. And Paula is such a great example of that. If you ever go to the Children's Museum, in Portland to meet her. Um, she is a reader there. Um, she gets a fair wage um, and is quite happy. So this is an example of why it's worth the long haul uh, in a class action because then every single person like Paula um, has access to competitive integrated employment. Hey, my name is Paula. Kids like me, they call me grandma and they call me short stuff. I like kids and I like people. I'm Paul Christine Lane, I'm a staff employee. Paula is part of the Portland Children's Museum family. I enjoy working with Paula because she comes in with this great positive energy every single day. I've been here, I like it, I do a lot of things here. jobs. That's what I say. I told the judge we need more jobs. People didn't have jobs. I feel happy when I see my first paycheck. I get paid twice a month. I go to a lot of concerts. It makes me feel better I got paid. That was a great video, Emily. So tell me a little bit about, about this is a vast mission you are undertaking. And, and I expect you have huge budget and many staff people and, and support from, how do you do it? 
It is a very good question. I like to think of it, I mean, I'll start with the hokey answer and then I'll start, and then I'll follow up with the real answer. I'm one of six kids raised by grandparents who survived the Dust Bowl. So I am scrappy and everyone I work with is scrappy. We are used to working with very little resources and maximizing those dollars. And so I think that's where I'll go to the serious answer. And I think really kind of the whole point of this presentation is if Disability Rights Oregon was on its own island doing this work, we would not have the impact we do in the state. We have the impact we do on the state because of the Mental Health and the Law Conference, because people learn about us and there are people coming and we form those relationships, whether it's with these other disability rights organizations, prosecutors, law enforcement, individual families. It's, we leverage the small amount of resources and staff we have by realizing we can't do it alone and partnering and reaching out to others to figure out where to push, how to push, and for me anyway, it's, and who isn't? Like, where are the, the, the places where we are unique in our ability to do something? And so when I think about our access authority, um, that's usually what I think about it. You know, are people being harmed in institutions or in places that other advocates can't get to? If yes, come to us, because that, that's what we can do. But um, it can be really daunting. And I think during this time, it's especially daunting and all we can do is realize that we have, you know, a relatively small federal grant and a relatively small but fierce uh, group of advocates at Disability Rights Oregon um, to really try to, to do this work with other folks outside of our agency. Well, you do have special powers that no other <laughs> advocate has. And so it's, it's, a, it's a cudgel and a... Uh, um, a, a method of inquiry. So it's a fantastic opportunity. So you have so such a big mission. There's so many things you could do. How do you go about determining your strategy of what you ought to do? We start with our annual priority setting. And so that's usually where folks let us know, we really think you should be doing all of this. Mm. And then we sit down with our board and council and we say, okay, from this, what, we sh what should we do? And we get to about here. And then I sit down with staff and say, okay, where can we really push? Who can we collaborate with? And maybe this piece is, you know, we're going to work with Nanny or the DB Coalition, and then we're only going to do this part of it. And then we're going to go back to our board and council and say, this is what we actually think we can do in 2020. Um, knowing that this is our collaboration, this is what really needs to happen, and maybe these other things are what we look at for 2021. Mm -hmm. That's a hard task. It is really hard. The hardest part of my job is saying no. Right, right. Tell me a little bit about the PAMI Council. So the PAMI Council are um, people who either identify as having mental illness or um, experience, uh, lived experience. So they may not identify as having mental illness, but they've been served by um, mental health providers, family members, or providers themselves. And right now we've got 12 PAMI members and they're the folks who look at, again, the requests of what we can do I and see. helps us and leads us into choosing what we should be doing. And there's a, an organization like yours in every state. Correct. And a PAMI council attached to that in every organization. Is that right? Correct. The other wrinkle um, is we also have a board of directors. And so under our federal mandate, the, the structure of both our board and our PAMI council has to be a disproportionate number of people with experience. Mm -hmm. And so that's really how we make good on our mission of nothing about us without us, is we, we really look to our board and our councils for direction, both in terms of um, our annual priorities, but also just overall governance of the organization. And these are people with both lived experience and expertise in many different business areas or medical or legal? Yes. Um, and for me, it's the lived experience in and of itself is often the most valuable because um, it will let us know, for example, 
Um, I used to work at Disability Rights Washington in our sister organization to the North. And we got our first board member who was also a veteran. And for the first time, we realized some of the disparities that existed within the Veterans Administration that you know, we would never have known about. Right. Um, and so you know, that's why we have to look at the diversity of who is advising us to make sure that it truly is representational of folks with disabilities in our state. Yeah, that inclusion cocktail is pretty toxic or, or potent, I should say. And you, <laughs> you start learning things you didn't want to know, but you need to know because you need to act. Right. Well, and the thing is, and then you're primed to act, I think because of that board member in Washington, my first year here in Oregon, um, we got a, a call from Paralyzed Veterans of Oregon, actually. And that's someone who served in the Iraq war and was um, paralyzed, was getting community services shut down and was gonna be shipped out of state. And because of my uh, connections in Washington still, I knew who exactly to call in Oregon to say, we need to fix this. And that veteran was able to stay in his home and see his son graduate from high school. Um, and so, you know, it's insight that you take with you, whether you move to another state or you have another fight, um, is we also have to think about, when you think about collaboration, a lot of folks, and I think even in this presentation, we talk about other advocates, but a key part of collaboration is also knowing who in state government is your ally mm. and who you can go to to help fix problems. Yeah, that's some lived experience as well. Um, <laughs> now, one of the people, one of the things that was surprising to me when I got involved in disability uh, advocacy is that there's no big tent. All, there's no tent that all disabled people live under and, and advocate through. And you're putting together these constituency groups and the, the octagon shaped uh, graphic you had shows, these are the com there are some common themes. Mm -hmm. There are, and I mean, I think, I mean, again, lived experience maybe helps is, um, and this may seem oddly personal, but this, I promise, will wrap back to your question, is I'm not only a person with disability, but I also identify as being gay. And what we know about the gay rights movement is they came up with a rainbow for a reason, yeah. is they realized each person, whether you're gay, lesbian, trans, queer, intersex, um, you have your own unique band that is unique to you. And I think what the disability rights movement can and should learn from that civil rights movement for, for queer folks is that we're all unique, um, but instead of acting separately and in our own lanes, if we came together and the rainbow analogy is great, but you know, we can come up with any other that's maybe our own, but that you know, when we act together, we don't lose anything. We only gain additional perspective, gain additional numbers, and hopefully gain additional influence when we try to shape systems. Great. Okay, let's see some more. Okay. Um, so the last thing I'd like to talk about today um, is another tool in systemic advocacy, which is legislative advocacy. And so just like our individual or systemic advocacy, we often have to focus on what we think we can accomplish. Um, this past short session, um, we had a few very um, narrow asks that are on this slide that will continue um, into the next long session. But before we go into that, um, we are anticipating there will be an emergency session. Um, and our number one priority, and frankly, our only priority for that special session is an equitable COVID-19 response. Something that I found completely shocking is the Oregon crisis care standards are completely silent regarding the needs of people with disabilities. They talk about race, they talk about ability to pay, they talk about all these other factors that are, are relevant and, and um, should be considered when you're looking at conditions for crisis care, because what it, they're really talking about is rationing. What happens when the demands for services outpace the resources to meet them? What we have seen in our country uh, and in our state is a, a dark and troubled history of who gets services. If you are white, if you're able-bodied, if you're educated, you are more likely than not to get a better healthcare outcome. 
um, whether that, that's in crisis or not. But certainly, if the standards that govern the conduct of hospitals, doctors, and nurses don't even mention disability, it's concerning. And so what we've already seen in the past few weeks in Oregon are decisions around quality of life, which is frankly a euphemism for does your, is your life valuable? And it is scary. Um, just yesterday, I, I, you know, it's really tough, but I heard someone say my life matters. Um, and we're not seeing that reflected in our state's um, crisis standards or their response. Um, and so we're really wanting to push that um, because we know specifically with this virus, it is going to have a disproportionate impact on people with disabilities with underlying health conditions and seniors. And so our number one goal um, in the emergency session is to mitigate those risks. So we think there are a few ways to do that. One, making sure there's an equitable response when and if we need to ration healthcare. Two, making sure all emergency information is accessible. A lot of people with intellectual disabilities don't understand the guidance that's coming out. It's not being explained in the plain um, language way. So there's a lot of fear and a lot of misinformation. And so that's our goal um, in the short session. And then um, goals two, three, and four. Again, we tried to get these pushed through um, in the last long session. Um, the first I'll talk about is guardianship protections. In Oregon, if you are a person with a disability and you and someone wants to uh, be your guardian and make decisions on your behalf, you do not have a guaranteed right to a lawyer um, if you can't afford one. I mean, in the statute, it says anyone can get a lawyer, but we know not everyone can get a lawyer. And so, similar to Gideon versus Wainwright, the right to a counsel. If you're charged with a crime, we want the same thing to be true for um, people under guardianship. And the reason for that is, you know, in the criminal defense context, it's because you're being deprived of your liberty um, potentially and being sent to jail. Well, in guardianship, you're also being deprived of your liberty in terms of deciding where you live, medical decisions, whether you get married. Um, et cetera. And so we think it's a really good analogy that there should be a guaranteed right to an attorney um, to contest a guardian or to terminate one if they're being abusive. So that's been a long standing priority of ours. Um, the other one, and probably of more interest to the folks in the conference, is a promise I've been hearing for a couple of years now, and that's the reinvestment of mental health resources away from the criminal justice system and institutions to community. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide, but that is um, and will be a priority of ours. And then finally, mink enforcement. Um, you know, while we have an order, um, we also have a state that um, has passed some legislation that um, undermines some of the protections in that order, and I'll talk about that next. So first, let's talk about um, that reinvestment. Um, many of you might know about, it was originally called the um, Behavioral Health Reinvestment, and then it was called the Impacts Bill, but it was House Bill 3281. And when it passed last session, the legislature appropriated 10.6 million for what they're calling diversion pilots. And so what, um, what the impacts work group talked about is this sequential intercept model, which is at the bottom of the screen, which really is there are five places within the criminal justice system where you can interact with someone with a disability, including mental illness, and take them out of the criminal justice system. It could be when there's the police are involved, when they go to jail, um, when they're reentering jail, or during parole and probation. And what folks are realizing is if you look kind of before law enforcement interaction, I like this spot right here. I call it intercept zero. Before the cops are even called, do people have access to intensive case management, coordination between systems, um, peer counseling, housing, substance use? A lot of things that we've been hearing about in the past two years, and I thought this was really stunning, is there's local data that of people who frequently recidivate in the criminal justice system due to their disability, 
over 70% have pilocrine. They have both mental health issues and substance use. Only 3% have actually gotten treatment for substance use. And so we really need to be looking at that gap. We also need to look at supportive housing. Um, you know, if people get the services they need in the community before their behaviors escalate and spiral, or we're even at one, um, that's really where we're going to reinvest the dollars in the best way in, in community programs so that folks never have to cross the threshold of the bill. That's my very strong feeling. And so we're going to be writing herd on this legislation. And unfortunately, um, we were expecting a request for proposal for these pilots in the fall. We still have not seen it. Um, in light of the pandemic, I don't think we're going to see it, but I've still been like shaking all the trees and the bushes to say, this is coming. If you're a provider, um, get ready, submit a proposal, um, and maximize the work you're doing to serve this population. Um, I mentioned the other bills that the state hospital um, frankly pushed for um, that undercut mink. The first and only one I'll talk about today is Senate Bill 24. This passed last session. And while we really liked the, the initial bill in theory, um, there's some unintended consequences. So the initial bill, initial bill wanted to limit who came to the state hospital. Essentially, folks who are being charged with misdemeanors, like stealing a cupcake or laying on a park bench, the state hospital does, doesn't want those folks to um, enter the criminal justice system, go through the aid and assist process, and get removed from all the services maybe they already have in the community, only to go through this aid and assist process and get spit back on the street. I mean, it's not worth it for the cupcake, basically. And so we agree with that, but the problem is people are still being charged with those crimes. People are still going to jail and being held for those crimes. And so even though the hospital is saying, no, not here, there's no then off ramp to where. And so um, we have been working with um, OHA and um, other state folks to try to get a fix to this. Um, we came up with a pretty decent one last session, but again, because of some of the shenanigans, um, it didn't get a vote. Um, and ultimately, what I worry about with this bill is our courts are, and think about the separation of powers, and I promise I won't go like civics professor on you. The court's role is to protect the most vulnerable. So if the executive branch and the legislative branch can't protect people through law or whatever reason. The court is your final option to make sure, again, that constitutional bedrock and the rights are being protected. Senate Bill 24 takes that discretion away from courts. So even if a court says, yep, this person is not only so mentally ill, they can't even assist, yep, they should go to the state hospital. This is the legislature gave the state hospital the ability to second guess for this and um, with no option. So we're really, really worried about this. Well, thanks, uh, Emily. Tell, tell me a little bit about what you mean by equitable in, in reference to COVID-19 and, and services for people with disabilities. So what we know based on the Oregon crisis care standards and the information that's coming out from the government is they're anticipating there may be a time when the demand for hospital beds, ventilators, tests um, are going to exceed how many of those services that are available. And so what you have left then is essentially a rationing or an allocation system. And what we worry about when I use the word equitable, I want to make sure there's an equal and unbiased approach to making those medical decisions. And what we've already heard, and it, it just is enough to break your heart, but what we've already heard is there are already hospitals and doctors saying, this person's quality of life, because they have an intellectual disability, an underlying medical condition, and I don't know, can't make six figures, um, their life is not going to be prioritized over the person who maybe can make the six figures or doesn't have the intellectual disability. 
And that value judgment um, is discriminatory. And so we need to make sure that there's objective clinical reasons for the decision making. And thankfully, um, after um, things like SARS and Katrina's, several states have looked at that to make sure that there's equal access to healthcare that doesn't have a different outcome based on disability or race. Um, and we've been pushing some of those standards. And so, for example, ventilators. New York um, had a law and ethics committee come together that decided that a treating physician should not make a decision about whether or not someone gets a ventilator because we know about implicit bias. And even if the doctor's not aware of it, they may be making medical decisions based on a value judgment of that person's life. Instead, what the ethical best practice is, is that the treating clinician works up those notes and they send it to a clinical body of, of bioethics who look at it from a, a independent like prognosis, like will this allow the person to go back to their life as before? And that, by removing that from potentially an, an individual person, you're having a more equitable or unbiased approach to deciding who gets services. It's surprising how difficult it is for people with uh, extremely good educations to think through ethical issues when they just don't have the tools to do that. That's right. And, you know, and the thing is that we have to remember is there are nurses and doctors who desperately want this information. I mean, I have friends who are doctors and nurses and are terrified about that day that they're all anticipating where they're going to have to make those life and death decisions. But and so the, they, and they too want those objective standards. They don't want it to be left up to them. Yeah, but the work has already been done. It was done a long time ago and is yes. you know, sitting yes. somewhere on someone else's desk. It's just, it, it, it seems to be a... Um, you know, when, when we get into these situations, people sort of skip the fact that ethics is a profession, not just a common sense experience. No, I agree. I mean, I think one of the darkest days last week is when I was on the call with a very large hospital. And when I was talking about making sure communication was accessible, mm -hmm. the head of their ethics department asked me what I meant. And I said, well, if someone is deaf and uses ASL, you need to have an interpreter. He didn't know what an ASL was. <laughs> well, it's true that those bioethics uh, um, committees have not been penetrated by people with lived experience yet. No, they haven't. And I think this goes back to, again, kind of the theme of this presentation is mm -hmm. we all can't know everything and we can't all do everything, but mm -hmm. we can certainly work together so that we can lift everybody up. Well, I, let, let me ask you another question. You, you mentioned uh, this elusive cupcake a, a moment ago, mm -hmm. and it seems that we could solve this legal problem just by l releasing ourselves from the responsibility of solving it. And we'd still have the clinical problem of these persons still needing care. Um, what, are, what can DRO help as far as uh, helping the care provision get better for these people who are caught in this uh, vortex, this legal vortex? I think the ultimate answer is expanding community-based behavioral health resources. And the beauty is, I think they want more resources too. You know, I have talked to some pretty large behavioral health providers in our state and from a bricks and mortar perspective, they have empty beds. They could take more people. They mm -hmm. want to take more people. They went to school so they could treat this population. Mm -hmm. What they don't have is the resources to hire and retain the staff to provide the care. And so this goes back to the 30.6 million that has already been appropriated. And this is before federal emergency assistance that the state has right now in its coffers. We are imploring them, use that money now. Use this emergency power you have now to like jumpstart this effort. The providers want it, the advocates want it, the people who need the services want it, let's do it already. I mean, and even the cat's yelling about it. The law enforcement community says, we don't want to do this. Right. 
I, I don't I think mean, that's truthful. I think they do want to do it, but um, but if the providers have un, untapped resources, untapped skills, why why is why does the money keep going into the law enforcement community? I mean, <clears throat> what we know is the law law enforcement is the safety net. They're the de facto yep. mental health provider. They're and important. I, and I will say this, and you know, I'm a I'm a zany advocate, mm -hmm. um, and I don't say this lightly. But I truly have never met anyone in law enforcement who wanted our clients to be in their facility. Yeah, they are put in a position of of confining people they are ill-equipped to respond to. They don't want folks there. What they worry about is public safety. And so where I think there is a little bit of discord is they worry about public safety. And to me, part of public safety are the people we're talking about who aren't safe in jail either. And so I think every jail commander I've ever met, every cop I've ever met, if they could take someone and engage them into mental health services and that be reliable, culturally competent, there's a level of engagement and it's not just dumping someone off at a door, but it's actual engagement, um, they would choose that over booking them any day. So we've come to the end of my presentation. Um, I did want everyone to have my contact information. Um, this is our address, um, my phone number, my email. Um, despite the pandemic, our office is still open. Um, and almost because the pandemic office needs to stay open. Um, the only qualification I will um, have in contacting me directly is if you are seeking DRO services, please call the phone number here, um, absent my extension, and ask to speak with someone in intake. And I say that because I'm often doing trainings like this or I'm in court and I may not be able to respond to you as quickly as our intake advocate team is, and trust that um, the small money team that I'm a part of is, if there's abuse in the garage, or if you know this requires my attention, um, they do alert to me directly. So if you're asking for services, please call our intake line, which again is our 503-243-2081. But if you have questions about this presentation, um, or want to reach out to me directly, please know that I encourage each and every one of you to contact me. And thank you, Jason, so much for including me. Um, I'm really sad that we couldn't do this in person. I really love the conference of the year, but I'm glad um, I at least know I can go to one place uh, on the website and uh, hear about everybody else that came and the information they wanted to share.